you, what does it mean to offer up a sacrifice of praise? I'm sure we've heard this term thrown around. Uh, Maybe you've heard worship leaders say it 
from the platform, like, let's offer up a sacrifice of praise or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's important that we know what this means. There's a lot of ways in which we can worship God and we can praise him and bring him honor and glory. Um, so this morning, I want to draw our attention to this one little piece of that. Uh, it's found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, and we're going to be looking at verses 15 and 16. Through him, that's Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So when we offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, uh, we learn here that it's through Jesus that it happens continually, um, and that it's the fruit of the lips of the people that acknowledge his name. And what is this actual thing that's happening? What is it that we're supposed to do to offer a sacrifice? Um, chapter 16, or sorry, verse 16 says, doing good and sharing what we have. And then we, uh, at the end of this, we see that it actually pleases God when we do that. Um, so there's many ways that we can praise God. Uh, there's many ways that we can offer up a sacrifice of praise to him. Uh, but these are just two that are mentioned here. So the next time you hear that, hear that term said, I want you to think about this. What does it really mean? Um, I think it's always a great thing as Christians that we take a second and a step back to really think about the things that we say and the things that we do um, and to be intentional about each of those. So um, I want to encourage you, let's continue to sing. We're going to sing about the gospel and the cross and Christ's sacrifice for us, which is really the whole reason that we even worship God. It's only because God came for us and saved us and now we can have a relationship with him through Jesus. And as an effect of that, now we can offer a sacrifice of praise. So let's praise God through singing. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood pulled down for us the weight of every curse upon him the final breath he gave Heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away. Perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is living. The stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. Church. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning. I have a few announcements for us. In the first is that it is Tom Llewellyn's birthday today. Happy birthday, Tom. Wherever you are at watching this, I hope you feel well celebrated, and I also hope you know how much this church loves and appreciates you as our pastor. Well, mark your calendars for this Thursday, May 7th, for an all-church game night. If you'd like to be a part of that, please sign up in the next couple days so that we can mail you the supplies that you need in order to join in on the fun. Also, mark your calendars for Wednesday, May 20th at 7 p.m. for another elder-led prayer. We would love for our entire church to be a part of praying for the needs of our community and those throughout the world at this time. Uh, as always, our church uh, prays every Wednesday as a church staff, and our elders pray throughout the week for the needs of our church. If you'd like to be a part of any of the events we talked about, or if you have a prayer request or any kind of need, you can email us at connect at gracechurchinfo.net. Good morning. I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles and open in to Acts chapter 17. We'll be reading verses 22 through 34 this morning. We're in the middle of our base camp series, which is laying for us the foundations of who God is, and Tom will be teaching us this morning that God is judge. Again, we're reading Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 34. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for 
In him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Demarius and others with them. Please pray with me. Father, that we acknowledge that you are Lord of heaven and earth, King of kings and Lord of lords. We recognize and acknowledge, Father, that in you we have life and breath and being. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your word. We thank you that we can hear your voice through it. We thank you. We are so grateful for our teaching pastors who invest their gifts and talents into the study of your word and preparing messages for us. And we thank you for the work of Tom's hands this morning. We pray, Father, that you will prepare us to receive this teaching. We pray that you would still our hearts calm our minds, free us from all distractions, help our hearts be attentive to this teaching, and capture us anew for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Many years ago, I, I used to have to drive to where my children went to grade school, and on that trip, I would pass a church. That church had a signboard out front where you could change the lettering, and I remember that for a while, the, the church sign read this, God videotapes your life, live accordingly. And as I passed that sign over a period of time, I remember pondering it and kind of feeling uncomfortable with that. I knew that it communicated a biblical truth, but I wondered, is that really the truth that we want to be displaying to people in that way every day as they drive by? Our, our relatives and our friends and our neighbors who don't go to church, perhaps don't know much about what the Bible teaches or what Christians believe, do they, we want them to... <clears throat> hear the message that God is paying attention to everything about you. He's recording every thought, word, and deed, and he's ready to whack you. Is that what we should be portraying to a world that doesn't really know God? Well, the last couple of weeks, I found myself uh, thinking about that sign, uh, mostly because in the passage that was just read to us, it seems to me that the Apostle Paul is saying, God is paying attention to everything about you, and he's ready to whack you. And so I, I want to ask the question, why did the Apostle Paul say that? Is that really a central part of the message? And if it is, how should we be portraying it to people? We are in Acts 17. Uh, it's a, a passage that is recounting the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. The book of Acts tells the story of the first 30 years or so of the Christian movement. And the gospel starts in Jerusalem and then moves from there, you might say in concentric circles, to Judea, the province in which Jerusalem was found. 
to Samaria, the province north of that, to the ends of the earth, it says. That means throughout the Roman Empire. And in fact, the gospel goes in concentric circles in Acts to different ethnic groups, starting with the Jewish people, then moving to the Samaritans, who were kind of a mixed group of people who had taken some elements of Judaism and some elements of a Canaanite fertility religion and mix them together and then move from there to the Gentiles. Um, the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, three of them are described in the book of Acts. They are about the church's mission to the Gentiles. And on the second missionary journey, Paul formed a new team and he, he left Antioch in Syria, which is north of Jerusalem and Judea. And he began to travel across what is now Turkey and he visited the churches that they had planted on their first missionary journey, and he planted new churches. And when they got all the way to the western side of Turkey, they wanted to move north into the northern part of Turkey, but they were not able to, and so they went across the Aegean and entered what is now Europe. In fact, they landed at uh, what is presently North Greece and Bulgaria, and uh, they went to cities there and began to plant churches. And because there was a threat against the Apostle Paul, the team sent him by ship to travel down the Aegean to Athens while they took their time traveling from where they were by foot down to where they later met him there. Now here in Athens, this one chapter describes Paul's ministry there when he was alone. This is an incredibly important passage in the New Testament. You can miss that by just reading it. But in fact, it is the only passage in the New Testament that gives us a rather full understanding of what the Christian message was to the non-Christian Gentile audience. And what I mean is this, the Gospels record the message of Jesus going into the Jewish synagogues, mostly in Judea. And um, the book of Acts records the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, but the place where the Apostle Paul and others always started was in the Jewish synagogues. You see, every city had a synagogue. And the synagogues were made up mostly of ethnic Jews who had been raised in that, who knew the law, who understood a great deal of truth about God. And Paul was using that to introduce them to the fulfillment of their own scriptures. But the synagogues also had another prominent group of people who were called God-fearers. God-fearers is kind of a technical phrase that describes Gentiles who had been attracted to the synagogues and regularly attended synagogue worship, but they had not yet identified themselves with the covenant people of Israel. They were still not converts, you might say, but they were God-fearing people. That's where the gospel always went. And so Paul was almost always speaking to a mixture of people who had some idea of the law and background in it or a lot of understanding of the law and a background in it. But this passage is the only passage in the New Testament that in an extended way tells us when Paul went to a group of people who had no understanding of the law, no interest in Judaism or even knowledge of it, what did he say? Well, this passage gives us a synopsis of what he said, and he essentially said three things, three points I want to look at this morning. First, he said, God is our creator. Second, he said, God is our sustainer. And therefore, he said, number three, God is our judge. Our creator, our sustainer, and our judge. And I want to look at those together. Now, as was his custom, Paul started in the synagogue in Athens and he began to preach to the Jews and, it says, the devout persons, that is, God-fearers, who were there. And, it says, he preached in the marketplace. That word is agora, and it's still called the agora in Athens, Greece. There's a mountain in the middle of Athens on which is the Acropolis. And on the side of the mountains, there are all these little shops and these twisted little streets. And that's called the marketplace, the Agora. He would go there and he'd just talk with whoever he could at that time. And apparently, there, some philosophers whom he met invited him to come to uh, speak to a group of philosophers who were at the... Um, gosh, I, I don't know why I can't remember this word. The Areopagus. Okay, I'm going to back up and start again. 
As was his custom, Paul started in the synagogues uh, there in, in Athens, and uh, he reasoned, it says, with the Jews and with the devout persons, that is, the God-fearers who were present. And it also says he spoke in the marketplace with anyone who happened to be there. Now, the marketplace, the word is the agora. And in Athens, the sides of the mountain where the Acropolis is found on the top is still called the Agora. It's made up of all these twisted small streets and there are markets everywhere that sell anything that you want to buy. And it says that Paul went there and he began to converse with people about the gospel. Some philosophers he met invited him to come to a meeting and, and they would, this was a meeting at a place called the Areopagus or Mars Hill. And apparently he was invited to go there to give a summary of his message to the official group that met there. And that message is what is recorded in this passage in verses 22 through 31. Now again, what we have here is the, the first occasion, as far as we know, of Paul or any Christian standing before a completely non-Jewish audience and, and speaking to them about Christ. Greece is known as the birthplace of philosophy. In uh, the fourth century BC, Plato and Aristotle taught. And um, really, since then, there aren't any new categories that philosophers think about. Pretty much all of them were identified. All the topics of philosophy were identified at that time. Of course, a lot of thought has been given, a lot of changes about what they said, but they're like the fountainhead of it all. All the topics were identified there. That is the birthplace of philosophy. And right there in the birthplace of philosophy, Paul preaches the gospel. Today, we think a lot about building a bridge to the non-Christian world. And much of that idea comes from this passage because what we see Paul doing is seeking to make a connection with his hearers across an ideological divide that was very great between his rooted in Judaism and the scriptures that have been given and theirs that were completely divorced from that, but highly intellectual. In the synagogue, the law was the basis for discussion. Much about God could be assumed, but the Athenian philosophers knew nothing about the law, had no interest in it. How would Paul connect with them? He makes a point of contact, and his point of contact is where he starts. It is an altar to the unknown God. Apparently, as he traveled around the city, we are told, he saw many altars. The passage says that he was provoked in spirit. The word means he was angry, burning inside over this idolatry. But he saw an altar that said to the unknown God. And um, to him, idolatry was not simply something that was odd or interesting as we might find it because it's so different to Paul. It was an affront to the truth about God, the most basic truth of how God had revealed himself in the scriptures. So he says in verse 23, as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul takes this observation and he segues from it into a conversation about the God they do not know. In fact, essentially what he is saying is, the one that you cannot name, but whom you seek to worship, or you wouldn't have built an altar, I'm going to explain that one to you. Essentially, the, the message he gives is based on two connected points. God is our creator and God is our sustainer. In fact, the, the truth is they have to be put together. God is our creator and our sustainer. And those ideas are, are woven throughout the passage. And we're given six verses in which Paul describes uh, what this means. God is our creator and our sustainer. I'd like to read them to you one more time, beginning in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God 
and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. He is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Well, essentially in those verses, he weaves together four points. The points are not given in consecutive order. They're kind of woven throughout the passage. Four basic ideas that tell us God is the creator and the sustainer of human life. The first thing he says is God created us and has authority over us. God created us and has authority over us. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it. Verse 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And he says that our relationship to God as our creator is similar to the relationship between a parent and a child. Verse 28, as even some of your own poets has said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, uh, that's an interesting word, offspring, that describing the relationship between humans and God as a relationship of parent and child. I know that it's common for people to say uh, that all human beings are children of God, but I have to note the Bible never says that. It seems to studiously avoid that. It says that those who are children of God are those who have faith in Jesus. That is, those who have received God's life, eternal life implanted within them, are connected to God by sharing God's quality of life. They are the children of God. But this is the one place in the Bible where it comes close to that, but it doesn't use the word children. It uses the word offspring. That's a word that would, would describe someone who was uh, generated or born from a parent but was not a natural child, not an heir of the family. And that's the description that he uses of humans in relationship with God. It's like a parent-child relationship, even if it doesn't call them children of God. And because, like a parent treats a child, God is like a parent to his children with all human beings, then um, God has authority over all human beings because we are all made in his image. And God is infinitely greater than his creatures. Verse 24, he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands. And God, here Paul uh, clearly teaches the creator-creature distinction. We are not God. We are not a part of God. There is an infinite distance between God, the creator, and ourselves. We are just a part, one element, an important element according to the Bible, but only one element of God's creation. That's the first point he makes. God created us and has authority over us. And then he says, secondly, um, that this God is involved in the world. He's involved in the world. Verses 25 and 26, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Now, throughout history, people all over the world in different places and cultures have conceived of God of there being a supreme God who has made everything and he is um, uninvolved in his creation. They usually conceive of the universe as a huge, incredibly complex machine, so to speak, that God has made and then he stands aside and he lets the machine run on its own without his involvement or concern. This is the God, frankly, that I was raised with. When I became a Christian, I remember at one point my father saying to me, Tom, your God is too small. He said, my God is so great, he's so big, that he would never concern himself with an individual human life. Thinking about God, relating to God, thinking that you can talk to God and he would listen, God is too great for that. Well, I can only say the Apostle Paul didn't think that. In fact, he thought that God was so great, 
so incredibly great that he does involve himself intimately in human life. And that's the point he makes in the passage. This God is involved in human life. He's involved in every way. This actually is the, the answer, or the basis of the answer that the Bible gives to a great philosophical question that has been uh, talked about through the centuries. It's the relationship between God's transcendence and his immanence. Those are words that describe his distance, his greatness, transcendence, and his closeness, his nearness, his immanence. Philosophers tend to think that those two things over which ink has been spilled for centuries are mutually exclusive. Either on one hand, God is so great as my father taught me, he is so majestic and so powerful that he is far away from us, he is distant and unconcerned with us as individuals because he can't be both transcendent and imminent at the same time. Or, on the other hand, he's close to us. This is more the side of modern philosophy, or at least many of modern philosophers, and much of stunted, distorted Christianity in our day. God is so close. He sits beside us like a therapist who commiserates with us that this vast world that he created and set in order is running on its way, but he has no control over it. He has no knowledge of how it's going to work out. I mean, that's what it's thought. There's, it's an either-or kind of thing, but the Bible's clear answer is God is both transcendent and imminent. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. That's obviously woven into this passage. It's stated most clearly in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. God is transcendent. And also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God is transcendent and he's close to those who bow to him with hearts broken over sin and dependent upon him. The living God, the wonder of it all, is so great that he is far above far beyond anything that we could think or imagine. He is the one whom no human has ever seen or can see. But he's also close to those who bow to him. Among Christians, there is none of this flippant idea that, yeah, God's right next to me. I talk to him all the time. That may be true. But it's not a flippant truth. It is with awe that the Christian says, the living God hears me when I pray. I mean, what he says is that God created us and he has authority over us, and that secondly, God is intimately involved in this world. His third point is this, idolatry is an inadequate way to represent God. Idolatry is an inadequate way to represent this God who creates and sustains life. Now, this is central to biblical thinking. It's not usually on the forefront of our minds because we don't face idolatry in its classic form every day. But know what Paul says to the Athenian philosophers in verse 28 and 29. He says, quoting a Greek philosopher, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being therefore God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and the imagination of man. This is one of three or four places in this brief little synopsis of Paul's teaching where he really uh, said something that should have been offensive to the Athenian philosophers. He was telling them that their idolatry was ignorance of the true God. But he was saying it in such a way that they didn't seem to respond to that, as we'll see. The point he's making is quite clear. Anything that takes first place in human life dethrones God. Anything that takes first place in human life 
Since we are his offspring, it follows that we are made to be like him. The Bible's word is his image. We are created in his image, not the other way around. If we, human beings, the image of God, are living, animated, conscious beings and not mere objects like an idol, a statue, then God must be the same and infinitely more a living, animated, conscious being. This is just as true today as it was then. Anything that uh, gives, is given first place in human life usurps, dethrones God, usurps his place. And that's what humans do. We can call it science today. We can call it human advance or human freedom, or whatever it is want, we want. But when we put something else, a concept, a thing, in the place of God, in first place in human life, we are seeking to dethrone him. You cannot replace God. You can only dethrone him, and that's what idolatry does. And the last point is this. There is in the human heart an insatiable thirst for God. There is in the human heart an insatiable thirst for God. Verse 26 and 27, And he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Now, this is a very interesting passage. He's making a point of contact with the non-believing mind, and he's saying there is in every human being an insatiable thirst for God. It's on the basis of things like this that St. Augustine in the 5th century wrote, um, There's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that cannot be filled with any created thing, but only with God made known through Jesus Christ. Now, it's important to understand what Paul is saying here and what he's actually not saying. He's not saying that human beings, unaided by God, apart from grace, without the revelation that's given in Scripture, human beings could seek God and find him. Because the Bible is quite clear that will never happen. Because of human sin, we do not seek for God in the way that we should. We take this insatiable thirst inside of us. And we will always, if left to ourselves, twisted in some way, we'll invent idols, we'll make up ways that we think God is like and what he wants, we'll degrade ourselves in our practices and the process. But nevertheless, he says, there is in the human heart an insatiable longing for God. So there you have it. God is both the creator and the sustainer of life. God created us and has authority over us. God is involved in this world. Idolatry is an inadequate way to represent the true and living God. And there is in the human heart an insatiable thirst for God. Well, if that's the case, then why, why does atheism exist? Well, the reason is um, the denial of God simply boils down to the inescapable conclusion to these points. If God is the creator and the sustainer of human life, it follows from it that you and I are personally responsible to God. And that's the conclusion he draws. That's the point he drives home. That's, so to speak, is his application to his hearers. The conclusion is, if God is our creator and our sustainer, then he must also be our judge. If God created us and sustains us in this world, and we are his creatures, then it follows that he has a right to evaluate our lives. Verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this, of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul says that in the past, God didn't judge idolatry as harshly as he could. 
He treated human beings, so to speak, as little children who uh, their parents don't hold against them every foolish thought and word that they utter. Fortunately, our parents didn't hold it against us. We don't hold it against our children. We recognize that there are children, they're growing up. And God, for a time, overlooked humanity's ignorance, it says, their refusal to acknowledge him, to honor him. I want you to note also that the words times of ignorance are one of those places that implies the Athenian philosophers, with all of their intellectualism, all of their pride, they were truly ignorant of God. Times of ignorance. They don't seem to have taken offense at that. But now what he says, things have changed. God at one time overlooked those things, but now three things have happened. First, God has appointed a judgment day. Verse 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. That is, he will judge, his judgment will be fair, exact, it will be just. Number two, he has not only appointed a judgment day, God has appointed a judge. He will judge the world by a man he has appointed, it says. And thirdly, God has proven this by raising that man from the dead. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. It's quite clear both from uh, the context and from Paul's other preaching that uh, he didn't finish his message. This was obviously not meant to be the last sentence that he spoke. He didn't even mention the name of Jesus, which would be unknown in light of all the other preaching that we have in the New Testament. It's obvious to us that he refers to Jesus, but he doesn't mention his name. And if Paul's full message, he says in Acts chapter 20, uh, calls for repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, he has not gotten to that point. That seems to be what his next point was going to be. He was on the verge of making that call to repentance and faith. And he stopped. Why was he stopped? He was stopped simply because he mentioned the resurrection. And if there's anything Greek philosophy could not stand, it was the concept of resurrection. Resurrection is not a belief that the soul is immortal and goes on forever. That's Greek philosophy. Resurrection of the dead, resurrection of the body, as it says in the Apostles' Creed, is the belief that God will raise the elements of the human body, reconstitute it and unite it with our eternal soul. And we will again be a body and spirit, complete unity, as we are now in this life. They couldn't stand the concept of resurrection, and that led them to uh, give three different responses, which are recorded in brief. Some, we are told, mocked. Probably the majority, we would gather. Some were open to hearing more, and some believed. Only two are listed by name. Damaris the Areopagite, who would have been a member of this philosophical society, would have been an important person, and a woman named Damaris. Now, um, what can we conclude about this? Some have thought that Paul's ministry in Athens uh, was a failure, that this passage is meant to demonstrate when he tried to reach into the Gentile community, he failed. He failed, they say, because of the incredibly small response uh, to the message and the facts that Acts does not record the founding of a church in Athens at this point. But there's nothing in the text that implies this was a failure. In fact, there are other places where the, the, the names listed are equally as small, and yet um, it's not judged as a failure. The point really has to do with the gospel. This is the message that Paul preached to people, and it includes this idea of judgment, and it helps us to answer the question, is God as judge a legitimate, central part of the Christian message? And the answer to that is, unquestionably, yes, that God is judge is, is a very important aspect of the Christian message. It doesn't mean that eternal judgment has to be preached every time the gospel is presented, but it must mean that a full understanding of the gospel requires a full understanding that God evaluates human life, that we are responsible to him. And we've entitled this series, Base Camp. Uh, and we're thinking that just as mountain climbers establish a camp at the base of a mountain and they put into that camp uh, all of those things that will be necessary for climbers as they go up the mountain, 
so that they can take those things with them or if they run out, they can send people back to get them. Just in the same way, we are thinking of what are all of the things that are necessary for a life of discipleship. And we're thinking more of conceptual things. What are the things, the ideas, the convictions that a Christian needs to understand and to have in order to engage in a life of discipleship? What are the things we need to be stocked up with if we're going to climb the mountain, so to speak, into a deeper relationship with God? And what we're saying this morning is that one of those essential convictions that we really need to have is this. Because God created and sustains us throughout our lives, he is our judge. Because God created us and he sustains us and is intimately involved in our lives in this world, because of that truth, God is our judge. He has a right to tell us how to live. Every word, every thought, every action of every human being will pass under the scrutiny of his gaze. He will evaluate the state of our heart in each of the things that we did each moment of our lives, just as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word. God has a right to tell you how to live. He has even appointed a day of judgment and a judge for that day. The wonder of the gospel is that the judge, Jesus Christ, is the same one who became our substitute on the cross and he took on himself the penalty for having broken his law. The gospel says God is our judge, but we can run to our judge for protection on that day. Let's go back to that billboard we started with. It, that billboard read, God videotapes your life. Live accordingly. I'm still troubled by that billboard. I'm not troubled by the truth that is communicated there because it is true and it's essential. But the problem I have is that when those words or something like that or even just the words, God is our judge, when those words are written, we're inviting people to um, put that idea in whatever context that they want. Uh, um, if they're a secular thinking person, they figure we have nothing to be judged for, and so those words are just kind of nonsensical and they can laugh them off. If they're, for example, a person who grew up with a father who was angry and vindictive and given to uncontrollable rage, they can put that statement in a context of thinking that's what God is like. And in that context, it makes no sense. No, we who are Christians are called to put this belief, this conviction into a context. And by the way that we live and the things that we say, to give that context to other people, that context is that God being our judge is simply an unavoidable inference from other and prior truths. It's because God created us. And in this world, by his providence, he is intimately involved in everything that we do and say. Like a parent, a good parent, he has both brought us into being and he's intimately involved and concerned for our lives. And because of that, God is our judge. Live accordingly. Let's pray. Our gracious God, again, we bow our hearts before you and we acknowledge that you are high and lifted up, that you inhabit eternity. You are far above and beyond us. And even though those words describe space, and that's not really what we mean, it's not that you are spatially far away from us, but you are so completely unlike us especially in your moral character. You're so unlike us that we think, how could we reach, know, or find the concern of a God of infinite holiness and power? And yet you have told us that through Jesus Christ, you have come close to those who are contrite of heart, those who come to you in repentance and faith and trust. 
that through the death of Jesus on the cross, you open your arms wide to receive us. You make us your children and you guide us on our pilgrimage through this world. We pray that this truth would both inform our minds and would also guide the way that we live because we realize that you have the right to tell us how to live, to evaluate our lives. And we ask that you would train us and teach us to be your willing followers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting With our hope and with our light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To the stones moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who had come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood, indeed his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me. Good morning. We are going to move now into a time of worship through giving. And as we do so, I just want to remind you that the Bible makes it clear that there are many reasons for which we ought not to give. 
Uh, we don't ever give to the Lord because we feel guilty not doing so, or because we've been manipulated by another person who's twisted our arms so that we would pull out our wallet. We also don't give to earn God's favor. That's not something that we need to do. Uh, we have received God's favor through Christ's work completely. And finally, we don't give just to kind of get God off of our back. But instead, we are told that we ought to give because we have been given too. That, that what we have received in Christ from God is uh, enough to make us grateful for the rest of our lives. And, and that joy, that gratitude is the attitude through which we are to give back to him. And not only that, but to extend his gift of Christ into uh, the lives of other people. Now, usually when we're at the building, the ushers would come forward and pass the baskets down the rows, and that's a very convenient way to give. We asked the ushers if they would be willing to do that this morning, if they would make house calls and, and, and come into your living room, but they said they wouldn't do that. But the good news is there are three other ways for you to give. The first would be to send a gift to our building. Second, you could visit us online at www.gracechurchinfo.net slash give, or you can send a gift of any amount by text to the number 84321. Why don't we pray together? Father, we just want to stop right now and recognize that everything that we have belongs to you. It's all yours. And everything that we have promised in the future is all a gift of your grace through Christ. And so we pray that as we recognize those things more deeply that our gratitude would grow and grow. We pray today that out of a sense of that gratitude and nothing else, that those of us who are able to do so would give to you uh, today or later this week. And we pray that you would be pleased not by the amount of our gift, but by the quality of our attitude and our desire to give back to you just a part of what you have given to us. We pray that you would use this offering to contribute to your work in our church and in our community and around the world. And we pray that you would help us in that work. We recognize that this is a time where your love and hope is needed so desperately and so we pray that our church would be a part of you uh, meeting those needs. We pray that we would serve you faithfully and that these gifts that, that will be received would be put to good use in ways that please you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Grace Church. Um, as many of you guys know, we're here in California, and because of the coronavirus, we just wanted to give you guys an update on our ministry um, and where the Lord has us. Unfortunately, this month we had to cancel a lot of travel plans we had just for our partnership development, um, and we haven't been able to go out. We've been staying at home, but we've been really enjoying this time of rest um, just as a family, getting other things done, um, trying to communicate and keep in touch with supporters. Um, yeah, and just trying to really embrace and enjoy some family time together that we get. Yeah, so we had plans to travel uh, basically the west half of the country, uh, sharing at different churches and uh, with individuals and small groups. Um, and that for that was for the month of May. And that kind of all got put on hold and potentially canceled. Well, all of it right now is probably canceled. We're hoping to reschedule a lot of that stuff. Um, so we're just praying uh, that we'll be able to do that. The government in Papua New Guinea has put at least a two month uh, travel restriction in and out of the country. Um, so right now that doesn't necessarily affect our leave date, but has the potential to become longer. Uh, secondly, the government stopped processing work visas at the moment. Ours is already in there, uh, paid for and ready to go. So as soon as the 
doors open back up in the labor department that our visa will go through uh, right away. The second factor is just the support raising aspect. Um, we've kind of had to put a pause on almost all of our support raising for the last, um, well, uh, part of March and the next part of April, um, and hopefully not into May. COVID-19 has really impacted our ability just to share our ministry vision with individuals and churches and stuff like that. So um, we're really praying that we'll be able to just pick up where we left off. And in the meantime, we've been helping out with, at our church, trying to serve uh, the elderly when they're in need, um, been doing some different projects there and trying to pick up some side work uh, when it's available. So a few praises we wanted to share with you guys is that when we left Michigan, we were at 50% funded and we are currently at 68% funded. So that's like super awesome, very exciting. And all of our legal paperwork has been going really smoothly up until now, just because of everything going on with the virus. Yeah, so we're just uh, a few praises or prayer requests, I guess that we have are uh, man, we'd really like to be creative in how we're going to share our ministry vision during this time when we can't meet with individuals, we can't speak at churches. Uh, we have a few ideas that we're uh, brainstorming and trying to trying to do, so uh, just prayer that that will go well and just wisdom uh, during that time. Uh, man, we'd love to be able to, we don't know when the doors are going to be open to Papua New Guinea yet, um, but when they do open, we would love to be 100% funded and ready to go as soon as they open so we can buy tickets and head over. Uh, so that's our goal is to, just to continue to raise support um, as fast as we can so when uh, the doors are open we can we can head over. And our last prayer request uh, is just for our partners that are also in support raising and um, man we just would really like to be able to go to the field at a similar time and just so that their support raising during this time would would go well. Lastly we just wanted to say thanks to each and every one of you guys. We're so grateful for the body at Grace Church and for your love and support and encouragement and your prayers, they mean so, so much to us. And um, we're really just blessed and really grateful to have all of you in our lives supporting us and behind us in our ministry. Yeah, we just value guys so much as co-workers and co-laborers in the gospel and just excited for what the Lord has in store for all of us as we move forward. So yeah, we, uh, we pray for you guys and uh, ask that you just do the same for us. And uh, yeah, thank you guys and we'll talk to you later. Well, again, we're meeting uh, by video feed uh, because of the coronavirus shutdown. I know that all of you, like me, are getting somewhat weary of this, and we're looking forward to that time, praying that in a couple of weeks, things will begin to open up. At the church here, we have been starting to give a lot of thought to what it will be like when we open up, but we can't really make any firm decisions until we see more how the opening up is going to be guided by the government and so we're looking forward to hearing those things but we will be communicating them to you however during this time while we can't meet together as we're accustomed to doing and as we long to do god is not far from us god is with each one of us we are still his people and we trust that uh, you each one of you will be seeking god in your heart reading his word seeking to know him to love him, to lead your children to do the same. And that is our prayer for you this week. May God bless you with his grace and his peace as you seek to serve him.